Hey everyone, this is Paris Chopra, and today I'm with Connor Lee, uh, who is uh, founder of Eleuther AI. Uh, that's a grassroots collection of open source AI researchers. Uh, their current project, uh, which is really ambitious, is to replicate GPT-3. Uh, it's called GPT Neo, and they want to make it available to everyone uh, because GPT-3 is closed and uh, you can't access it unless OpenAI gives the access. Um, Connor is uh, really interested in AI safety uh, and particularly he thinks a lot about the risks AI systems pose when they're not aligned to human values and systems. Uh, he believes that GPT-3 represents a fire alarm that just increased the urgency to work on AI safety problems. And that's broadly what we're going to talk about today uh, with Connor. So thanks, Connor, for taking time out today. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Great. So, Connor, before we begin into why what AI misalignment is and why GPT-3 is a fire alarm, would love to understand uh, more about how did you become interested in AI and AI safety in the first place? What were the events that made you really think deeply about this problem? So, um, at risk of sounding cliche, I always wanted to be a scientist since I was a little kid. You know, I always loved science, loved experiments, loved like, I was as good as math, but, you know, I, I was curious, you know, I loved science, loved technology. And so, as I got older, I got more and more interested in like, okay, what are the big questions of science? What are the really interesting big questions? So, you know, I was first, I was interested in like biology. Then I thought, well, biology is made out of chemistry. So then I tried to look at the chemistry. I'm like, well, chemistry is made out of physics. So, I, so I started studying physics. And then I kept going until I kind of realized, well, the fundamental part of all science is intelligence. Without intelligence, there's no science. Intelligence is what allows us humans to understand things, to solve problems, to learn more about the world. And so I started looking into that. I started studying that. And it turned out to just be something I very much enjoyed, something I, that I found in um, into like the right kind of intellectual for my tastes and uh, really inspiring and useful. And that, it, you know, it promises to solve many of the problems that I would like to see solved in the world, if not all of them. And yeah, so I had like a, a few years as I think most AI people have, or many AI people have, where you're a little bit like super optimistic. You're like, damn, this is going to solve everything. This is going to solve aging and, you know, create world peace and, and stop world hunger. It's, it's going to be great. It was going to be perfect. Like, like Kurzweilian singularity type kind of stuff, beliefs. And then I was exposed to the writings of Eliezer Yudkowsky, um, in particular sequences. And those to me presented in the first time these concerns with AI alignment. And it just kind of like, it was just like so obvious to me immediately. I felt like an idiot that I hadn't noticed this. Is it, yes, of course. AI might have the power to you know, solve world hunger, you know, create world peace and whatever, but you have to actually get the thing to do that. It could also do anything else. It's, it's, it's the old genie you know, fable, but in now in a, in a far more real you know, mathematical technical sense is that human values are very hard to define. It's very hard to control algorithms that you know, are extremely powerful, that are you know, smarter than us. You know, this is also a version of what's called the principal agent problem in economics is that if you have an advisor and the advisor is smarter than you, how do you, how can you make sure that the advice your advisor is giving you is actually helping you and not helping the advisor? Right, right. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, I recall uh, my interest in AI has been very similar in trajectory and it is common in mean, getting first interested in from an engineer and scientist mindset that, hey, it will be cool to replicate intelligence I remember that's how I got interested in neural networks. And then the applications of AI become suddenly very interesting. Maybe you can make profit from it. Maybe you can solve world problems. But I realized even uh, as you've realized that uh, the dangers of it, and very simply, I mean, the danger in the most trivial sense is, say, loss of jobs, right? Uh, or automation gone wrong in some sense. And then you realize that intelligence is a double-edged sword. It's just not... Uh, uh, all the good things and riches, but it carries risks as well. But I did want to talk to you about, because uh, when most people think about risk of AI, I think the risk of automation of jobs and losing the jobs is the first thing that comes to their mind. But to be clear, that's not what you're talking about here, right? Uh, it is definitely a problem that will happen, but it's not the thing I am most worried about. So 
I've like, so I am most worried about, you know, like literal extinction of the human race, you know, or like, or even worse scenarios of that, you know, something like, you know, we build a super intelligence that has some very strange beliefs about what it thinks is good and you just destroy the entire universe in that process doing whatever strange thing it decides to do. This sounds very sci-fi-esque and I understand that. And um, that's why I usually don't present it that way. For first people, I like to present it more in the way of just like, okay, you know, Imagine you've just found something really, really smart. It's way smarter than you. It's way more powerful than you. How do you control it? How do you make sure it does the good things and not the bad things? Do you even know what good and bad means? Like these are questions that have dogged philosophy since philosophy's exception, since human inception. They're very, very hard problems. So I like to think about it kind of like it also like philosophy with the deadline is that we is that up until now, if you didn't have a good philosophical theory of good and bad, it didn't matter too much. Most people have a pretty good idea of what good and bad is. You know, not all people, unfortunately, but good enough, right? You know, the world has been getting better on most metrics. You know, people have been doing better thanks to technology and whatever. But there's no universal law that that has to continue. And if you now have super powerful systems that give us superpowers, like if humans, if you could, if humans could be superheroes, if we had superpowers, suddenly it really matters if we know what's good or bad to a very, very fine, de- a very, very fine detail that in a, in a way that it wasn't relevant before. So the job loss thing is absolutely something that will happen. And I wish more people would think about it more soberly. I f- feel the discussions about job losses are kind of a little bit confused or misdirected. They often say like, oh, there's going to be, don't worry, technology has always made enough jobs for everyone. It'll be fine. Or other people, you know, have like very strange beliefs about, you know, robots are going to, you know, become sentient and revolt against us or something, which is also very silly because why would they do that? If we don't program them to do that, why would they do that? Um, So it's, so like as Stuart Russell says, the worry is not spontaneous, spooky emergence of consciousness. It's just the ability to make very high quality decisions. So that these, these systems, if we give them a goal, we should expect them to be able to achieve those goals extremely effectively. They would be extremely cheap. They would be extremely efficient. You know, so if we have a system that just does every job a human does twice as good for half the price, there'll be no reason to hire humans, period. Why would you? It would just be a waste of money. Right, right. I mean, I love this phrase, philosophy on a deadline. I think that concretizes the urgency for solving this problem. Uh, but getting to basics, uh, Connor, how would you define the alignment problem of AI? Um, yeah. So the alignment problem has kind of become like a, uh, just a common term to refer to a certain subset of AI safety research. So like the terms are are in flux, like these change, like it, it used to be called friendly AI. And then, you know, some people call it, there's been different terms. It's kind of devolved. So like it is very much a reference to a certain niche kind of um, research that isn't yet really mainstream. So there are a few mainstream voices, um, in particular, like Nick Bostrom from the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University and Stuart Russell at uh, Berkeley University and such that are okay for these kind of things. Basically, the idea is the alignment problem says is that um, getting machines to do good things, uh, getting very powerful optimizers to optimize for human values will go wrong by default. This is a very hard problem. This is not a trivial problem. This is is a problem that can hopefully be solved, but it won't be solved by default. So a lot of people have like this, the, one of my favorite very confused beliefs about alignment is this idea that, well, if it's so smart, it'll figure out what the right thing to do is and just do that. And that's, in my opinion, a very, very silly thing to believe is that, you know, there's one of the, I guess one of the most founding important principles of AI alignment to understand is kind of is this idea of the orthogonality thesis. So it's kind of this idea that you can have an, an arbitrarily intelligent system maximize almost any goal. So like, you know, humans, we have these very complicated goals. You know, we want like, you know, security and food or whatever. We also want like happiness and we want our friends to be happy and we want, you know, all these like social goals. Like we have like lots of complicated beliefs. But if I wanted to, I could build a machine that's, you know, 100 times smarter than a human that only wants to, you know, make paper clips. It just wants to collect as many paper clips as possible. And that doesn't make the system dumb. It would still be able to trick humans. It would be able to develop technology. It would be able to, you know, execute strategic plans to get more paper clips. 
And that's something that for us humans doesn't make sense because obviously there's no human that you know just wants paper clips. Like that obviously is not something that exists. But just because it doesn't exist in humans doesn't mean it couldn't exist in an artificial mind. So, so that's kind of like the first ingredient. And like the second ingredient is this idea that human values are complex. Is that it's really is that the among all the possible values our systems could optimize for, those that we humans would consider good are an extremely small subset. And hitting that subset is very, very hard. It's a very hard technological uh, question. How can we build systems that will reliably hit that goal and not do something strange? Right. Uh, I guess when when researchers talk about um, AI alignment issues, sometimes it does come across as abstract in the sense that there is no evidence of this happening yet. But I, I feel the evidence is all around us in the sense I agree. Uh, when we talk about systems, uh, systems are in very crude sense, uh, AI, in the sense, if you talk about, say, what happened in World War II, uh, the Holocaust by the Nazis, uh, they were quite efficient and intelligent in their operations, but it was just misdirected. The values were not aligned to the values we today hold. Absolutely. So I'm actually one of the people that believes that the AI alignment problem is actually a much older, much more fundamental problem than the way it's phrased often. Is that in many ways, Economics, for example, is the same problem as the alignment question. The problem, the problem of alignment, the way I would phrase it. So this is just my phrasing. Don't like quote me, like quote other people on this, because I have this is just the one I use. I know how many other people would agree with this definition. My definition of alignment is, is that it's the question: How do you control a strong system using a weak system? So if humans are weaker than this more intelligent system. How can we still control these systems in a meaningful way? And in many ways, that's the same thing. Like with these, like as you say, like these political systems. How can the citizens control a government? How can um, how can policymakers control uh, an economic system? You know, we have these very strong optimized systems, like uh, like you said, like with the with the Third Reich was a very powerful optimizing system. And the question is, and is you know, what is it aligned to? Right. How could you how could you align it to something that you might think is more good? It's a very large class of problems, and the alignment problem, as we define it nowadays with intel artificial intelligence systems, is really just a um, much more concrete, you know, a, like a, a new techno techno version of, a, of an ancient problem. Right. I recall um, watching a video where uh, I don't remember who was the speaker, but uh, his argument was that corporations are proto AI. I mean, corporations optimize for profit. And that's the goal they've been given by shareholders. And yeah. uh, we all know what uh, uh, the negative effects and externalization of all the sort of consequences that happen when corporations blindly chase profits, right? From pollution to climate change and so on and so forth. So this AI alignment problem is not as abstract as it would appear in the first glance. Yeah. I would absolutely agree with that. I like the phrasing proto AGI because it's also a mistake that some people make is that they expect uh, like future AGI to work like corporations, and that's not true. That's like I expect AGI to be much, much, much smarter than current corporations. Like current corporations are still made out of humans, so the they may have many more resources and much more executive capacity than a single human. But the maximum level of intelligence that emerges from a, a corporation is not, you know. 10 orders of magnitudes beyond humans or something silly like that. It's still, and it still can be controlled by humans. You know, there's still humans you can put into jail. There's still humans you can tax. There's still humans you can interact with. So like, yeah, I, I like that framing in that the, the idea that, you know, we regulate corporations on a governmental level is in many sense an attempt at alignment. We tax or we forbid, you know, um, pollution because it, because that's what the system would do otherwise if we don't enforce it from this like alignment perspective. I unfortunately don't think that many of these techniques that we currently use to regulate corporations will work for AGIs for many reasons, mostly because of capacity or just intelligence. Like if a corporation was run by people that were all, you know, 10 times as smart as an average human, I don't think we could regulate it. They would be too powerful. They would figure out strategies to trick us and to manipulate us and to get around any anything that you know an average person could come up with. So, is it fair to say all the research that's happening for AI alignment will have benefits outside of AI? Maybe we'll get to learn how to govern these uh, like bigger systems than humans better than we do now. 
I think it's imaginable, but it's not really a uh, priority. Like there are some people in the AI alignment sphere, like I, I don't know if Robin Hansen would consider himself part of the sphere, but he's an economist at the George Mason University. That's like, he's, he's always been kind of a part of the field. He's always been around and he works on like principal agent problems and like how to align systems like that. So it's imaginable, but it's not a goal of the field per se. Um, a lot of that is uh, kind of predicated on this belief that in the future, the optimizing systems that will matter will be AGIs, is that, you know, there will not be human corporations or governments that have any appreciable power, is that those systems will be replaced by their AGI equivalents. But yes, potentially many of like, especially people who work on like, you know, agent cooperation type things. I think Andrew Critch is another person who works with stuff like this. I haven't read his stuff in a while, so I might be wrong there, but I remember him also writing quite a lot about the kind of things like, how can we get different agents in like different game theoretic scenarios to work with each other? Uh, there is, so yes, there's a lot of overlap. Okay. So is it fair to say the reason this problem is just so urgent is because, and when I say this problem, let's say the problem of a, alignment of values to intelligence is because we expect intelligence to explode. And, uh, and that just makes things way worse. If corporations are like an evidence of what is to come, then thousand and 10,000 X of that intelligence is even like riskier. Yes, that's absolutely how I see it. So, I mean, the there is the human brain is very very bad at pro, at projecting exponential trends. A perfect example is COVID. Like we've had this wonderful example of how humans just are really really bad at understanding exponential curves. Is a P, I remember this. Like I was the first in my group of peers to start panicking about COVID back in early February, and I was late. Like I should have panicked in January. Like all the evidence existed, but um, I hesitated. And so in early February, I started telling people, no, 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 buy food, you know, get into your homes, clear things up, this is going to be big. And I was shouted at, you know, I was insulted, I was, you know, looked down upon, I was denigrated, saying I'm an idiot, and I'm panicking, it's so stupid and whatever. And said, so, oh, look, it's just 20 cases. Oh, look, just 30 cases. Who cares? It's not that big, right? And I'm like, no, this is exponential. 20, 40, 80, 100, 1,060, you know, 160, this goes fast. But people are very bad at understanding this. The most famous exponential trend is, of course, Moore's law. And everyone keeps tummy aching about, oh, Moore's law is ending, blah, blah, blah. And that might or might not be true. I personally don't think it's true. I don't think the evidence really points to that. It might be slowing down, but I don't see it ending really anytime soon. But even if it was ending, the uh, the more important graph, which whose name I forgot, might have been Joy's law, but I might be wrong, is this idea of the number of flops you can buy per dollar. And that has been decreasing at a very, um, you know, consistent, like 10 times decrease per 10 years since like actually before, you know, a transistor even existed, like even back to vacuum tubes. This has been a very consistent law. And that's the actual law that matters because so hu like humans have this perception of intelligence as kind of like this like line where you have like, you know, okay, it's like on the far left, we have like worms or something. And then like a little bit, to the, you know, a little bit further down the graph, you have like, you know, insects maybe. And then at some point, you kind of have like maybe like amphibians, like fish, and then uh, you know, a few steps further, you have like, you know, like maybe like mice, maybe a step further, you have like a cats and dogs, and then like a step further, you have chimpanzees, and like one step further, you have like a human. So that's kind of like how people imagine it to be. And that's probably not totally wrong. You know, if you look at the number of neurons in the brain, given body size, you have to control for body size. It's larger animals have larger brains to control their larger bodies, and they're not necessarily more intelligent for it. Um, it's, it's a pretty decent approximation, but the thing is, is that humans then also believe that the difference between say a really stupid human and the smartest human is very, very large because to us, you know, the difference between, you know, a very, a very dumb human and Einstein seems massive to this huge difference, but their brains are the same size. They have roughly the same amount of neurons. It's a very small difference, biologically speaking, between these two. It's not nothing, but it's very small. Also, the difference between like a chimpanzee as a human is actually much smaller than you might think it is. The human brain is basically just a scaled up chimpanzee brain. We have all the same structures, we have all the same neurons, higher to have all the same, you know, brain regions or whatever. So what I and others expect to happen is, is that, you know, so far is that what we're gonna what we're gonna see happen, what we're currently seeing happening is that people are like, oh look, it, it can do worm things, that's kind of cute. Oh look, it can do cat things, that's kind of cool. Oh look, it can be oh shit. That's what we expect will happen. Is that 
we expect it, or many people expect it to, you know, like kind of like approach human level and then kind of like level off. Because like that's how sci-fi movies are often presented. Like, you know, the the robots are a kind of human level, but you can you know, still trick them, you can still talk to them. You know, they're they're basically just humans wearing funny suits, you know, with a weird coat of paint on them. But what I expect to happen is because of this exponential trend, is that you know, the year after we have human, we're gonna have double human, quadruple human, octuple human, you know, and much or and much, much faster. And these systems will have a lot of benefits that biological systems don't have in scaling. Like uh, the reason the human brains aren't bigger to a large degree is just it doesn't fit through the female pelvis at birth anymore. We're already born extremely premature in order to allow us to have larger brains. So our evolution is already super hard to optimize for human brain size. And we've been hitting physical limits. But those limits do not have to exist for digital systems. We can just buy more computers. We can just, you know, scale up to Amazon Web Services, just command the entire data center and make a super intelligence. To possibly. So I expect Intel AGI to be very different from the corporations and human systems because I expect it to speed right past the human limit and become, you know, 100,000 times smarter than the smartest human ever in like a very, very short time. Right. So I have a couple of questions on this. Um, one is around um, why do you expect this uh, exponential increase to happen? Is it just because of Moore's law or is it because our knowledge of engineering AI systems is also getting better over time. And the second question I had was more around economics of it, because definitely uh, you require resources to build a bigger, or to run a bigger AI. Yeah, so that's excellent questions. So uh, the first question is, so OpenAI a few years ago released a report on the scaling of artificial intelligence systems, and they actually found that their capacities were growing faster than Moore's law because of algorithmic progress. As far as I could tell, this trend is still holding. So it's like doubling every 18 months, I think, or whatever. And so this brings us also to GPT-3. So um, one of the main reasons I now take these arguments extremely seriously, like way more seriously than I even took them before, is GPT-3. GPT-3 is very interesting because of how uninteresting it is. GPT-3 is a very simple model. It's a very dumb algorithm. It's a very, you know, like old stuff that just, it's the same thing as GPT-2, basically. It just made a hundred times bigger. And that somehow created a like a phase shift in the performance of this model. It suddenly was able to perform very complex, high-level tasks that we that you know people predicted would take years to solve, just were solved by just making the model bigger. And so this is what's called the scaling hypothesis. The scaling hypothesis posits this idea that we can reach arbitrary intelligence or close to arbitrary intelligence just by making our models bigger. This was obviously considered a very silly idea for a very long time, but I now consider it us to have a lot of evidence that this is actually true. It seems to me that we have a lot of evidence. So there's also been several scaling law papers that have opened the eye in other labs that showed this, is that on many different tasks, not just text, but like video, image, many of these tasks, if you just make the model bigger, just bigger and bigger, bigger, more computers, it just gets better. And like this constant power law rate. And there seems to be, as of yet, no sign of this power law stopping. It might be that it starts curving upwards sometime, or even downwards sometimes soon when it stops. That might be. But currently, we have no evidence that this is the case. So for me, the simplest possible scenario, the simplest possible prediction is just that this will continue. Our models will continue to get better and better and better. And we should prepare accordingly. There is a lot of circumstantial evidence Pointing to this, I'm not going to like exactly you know reference because it's not really matter. Because I think this core argument is simple, and we should keep it simple. It's just we should expect superhuman intelligence if nothing strange happens. It is the least weird outcome. If progress just continues as it has for the last decades, if you know, uh, you know, if AI progress just chugs along as it has so far without any interruptions, we should expect superhuman intelligence very very soon. I would like to call out one source in particular. I'm going to butcher her name. I, I really apologize. It's uh, Ajaya Kotra, I think, from the Open Philanthropy Foundation has a has a biological anchors uh, draft report where she tries to estimate the arrival of uh, like transformative AI using several different metrics, including investment. How much will these things cost? How much will people be willing to invest in these systems? And such. So it is, in my opinion, by far the best summary of this work. It's very, very long. It's incredibly detailed. It is, it is beautiful. 
I would, if people want to understand these like timelines, where it is coming from, what factors influence this thing, I would say that her report is by far the closest to my own personal beliefs. My timelines are very close to her aggressive prediction in the paper. I'll put that link in the podcast for sure. You said open awesome. philanthropy report, right? Yeah, it's, it's from the open philanthropy. Um, I don't think they've published it. I think it's still a preprint or like a okay. pre-release. I, I can link it to you. Okay. Uh, so getting back to the question of economics, uh, Connor, uh, running bigger and bigger AI systems would require more and more computing, electricity, and so on. Where are we going to get it? Don't you think we'll hit a natural limit to how powerful a system can be just purely from economic reasons? Of course, eventually we will. I just expect that limit to be far, far, far beyond human. Okay. Uh, and 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 again, just to contextualize uh, once again, the problem we are talking about, I was just, while you were speaking, I was thinking in context of corporations once again, in the sense how when we t- tend to regulate them, they find all legal hoop- loopholes uh, so they would sort of jump around in tax jurisdictions and do all sorts of things to comply with our instructions and yet not be aligned to what we are trying to do. And you're expecting a super uh, human intelligence would be just much more efficient at exploiting what we tell it, but still not be completely aligned to us because we even we don't know uh, exactly what our desires are. Yes, absolutely. So there's there's um, a witty uh, a witticism called Goodhart's law, and it basically says is that you know any any proxy for a real value that is put under optimization pressure will cease to be a good metric. So if you give someone uh, like for example, you, you want your coders to write more code, to write like better code, so you tell them you're going to pay them for every line of code they write. Well, what happens? Well, they're just going to write a bunch of dummy code that doesn't do anything. There's a famous example, I think it was from Oracle, where they did a similar thing, where they, they, they would like pay a premium or something by the amount of bugs that they fix per week. So they just introduced a bunch of bugs so they could fix them. And so we should expect, this is at the hard, at, at one of the core problems of the alignment problem is this idea of good hearts law and how you can get around it, is that we do not have a perfect definition of human values. It's probably unrealistic to imagine we could ever get such a thing. We can always get proxies. And the problem is, is that if you have a pretty bad proxy, but you have a pretty bad optimizer, it's not that bad. Like human brains have a pretty bad proxy for a true belief. You know, I mean, we all do things that we actually don't want to do. Sometimes we yell at our friends or you know, we eat more cookies than we should have or something. We all do things that we regret, but it's not the end of the world because you know, if I eat too many cookies, you know, that could destroy the universe. It's just something stupid I did. But if I was a superhero, if I was a God, you know, and I, you know, do something that's that's on the line that is like sort of stupid that might be extremely da- dangerous so that's this problem of having you know a, a true value and then some kind of proxy which is nearby but it's not exactly there if you if you exert enough optimization pressure on that proxy it will very often find extremely strange edge cases that really don't make sense but technically fulfill the proxy right i want to get uh get back to this question of super intelligence. Uh, when you were talking about it will increase uh, in an exponential fashion, I think there's an underlying assumption that uh, intelligence is say a thing in itself means it's unidimensional, but uh, what if intelligence is something which is not one thing. And just to concretize this, for example, uh, if we believe Albert Einstein was really intelligent, do we expect him to excel at all types of problem solving? I mean, could he come up with a better form of democracy, for example? Do we, so, see, so yeah, I mean, what if intelligence is just multiple things, including artistic language, political intelligence, so on, and uh, how do we know AI will be really good at all of them? So I know that the definition of intelligence is extremely important in the first conversation, but I would like to also raise, that I think it's kind of a red herring, is that so I, I personally use an instrumental definition of intelligence. I don't really care what intelligence is. I just say it's the ability to win. Intelligence is the ability to win, whatever that means. Is that is that an intelligence is that if I give a, a system, an environment to interact with and a goal, and it succeeds that goal, I call that intelligent. People can disagree about that and say, oh, that's totally redefining the thing. 
that's fine. You know, there's there's plenty, there, there's literally hundreds of definitions of intelligence under the sun. And I use this one because it reminds me personally of what I care about. For example, is my system conscious? Does it have memory? Does it do learning? None of those things actually matter for what I care about. What I care about is, will the system destroy the world? Or not? You know, will it make the world a better place? Will it cure cancer? That's what I care about. So I try to focus on this question of far more how capable it is. Of course, there is the idea that maybe, so this is like this like this like, you know, kludge definition of, of intelligence that humans are like this like kludge of like lots of like uh, specialized parts. We have like one special speaking part and like one special art part and like one special blah, blah, blah part. And probably partially true. Like we definitely have like something that like biases us towards language learning. There's like this, there's like weird thing where, you know, if you bring up children with like a uh, language that lacks certain features called a pigeon, they develop spontaneously their own language called a Creole, which has like very specific features. And this has happened like independently multiple times across the planet. So it seems to be like something kind of like proto-language embedded in the brain, maybe, perhaps. It's like, there is like some of those things, but Given the evidence that I have seen of how we just take this really big model and we just throw computers at it and it just learns all kinds of different things, I expect that there is something that is approximate enough to a unidirection of intelligence that it's worth thinking about. I'm not saying it's this is the ultimate be all end all definition, but it seems to me that you know, like the difference between GPT-2 and GPT-3 seems to point at something that I personally would consider a scale of intelligence. The GP3 is not just better at one thing, you know, it can do better math, it can do better poems, it can do better reasoning tasks. It's not perfect at any of those things. But if you put it on a scale with GPT-2, it feels to me like there is a meaningful way of describing the difference between these two things as difference intelligence. You might disagree, and I think that's fair enough, but this has been a useful model for me to use. Okay, let's stick to the definition of intelligence being the ability to win and uh, assume that's true. Um, how do we know that um, bigger problems uh, are actually conducive to getting broken down algorithmically, which is something intelligence will apply? For example, what if in some of the big problems, there is a significant uh, randomness? and no amount of high intelligence can crack them up. And similarly, I mean, very concrete example would be say chaotic systems. Some of the systems are just so unpredictable where random fluctuations can uh, change their outcomes. Say a stock market is a perfect example. Uh, there's lots of feedback loops and just you, you can't just uh, try to sort of predict what is going to happen stock market, say one week down the line, no matter I mean, I, I don't know, it's it's not something uh, I know for sure, but I have a feeling it's just not a matter of intelligence. It's in the system itself that it's just so complex that even a super intelligence might not be able to solve it. What are your views on that? Well, of course, that's just obvious. Like you, you don't even have to go to the stock market. You just take algorithmic problems like encryption or, you know, MP hard problems or, you know, even harder things in the polynomial hierarchy that are just provably impossible to solve with, you know, any resources existing in the universe. Of course, super intelligence will not be able to solve that. Intelligence isn't magic. The point is a human can't solve those either. You know, if I give you an encryption key, you can't just, you know, crack it because you're a human. These are just fundamental laws of mathematics and physics. So, I mean, the stock market, I actually kind of disagree because I think the, the, the quote unquote chaoticness, quote unquote, uh, you know, algorithmic complexity of the stock market is actually a function of human intelligence. I think the reason you can't exploit the stock market is because you're not a hedge fund with 100 PhD, you know, geniuses and supercomputers. I think if you were a hedge fund with 100 PhD super geniuses and supercomputers, you could crack the market, at least enough to extract profit from it. The same way I predict that a extremely intelligence system that's, you know, that's, let's say, smarter than all humans combined could crack the stock market, but it couldn't crack a, you know, a quantum secure uh, encryption key. Right. But then doesn't that put an upper limit to the amount of damage it can inflict? Well, it, it, there is an upper limit, but I think that upper limit is far beyond destroys the entire planet. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't care about it too much. Okay. Um, I mean, we have uh, time and I'm very interested in knowing uh, like justification behind this belief. So why do you believe that upper limit of the damage it can inflict is really high? 
it just seems kind of obvious. I mean, have you heard of nuclear weapons? Yeah. I mean, humans were able to build those. Why wouldn't AI be able to build those? There's also a, so this is, there's a lot of like subjective kind of probabilities that get into this or like just, you know, just so stories. Like a famous just so story that I found very fascinating is the story of the conquistadors. So like uh, Pizarro Cortes and several the other people who were, uh, so the, Pizarro Cortes is one of the most bananas Wikipedia articles you're going to ever read. I highly recommend all listeners to go read the Wikipedia article on Cortes. It's an absolute trip. It, it, it's wild. Sorry, so Cortes. Cortes, yes. He was a Spanish conquistador who okay. conquered the Aztecs. Understood. And, and um, the story is just absolutely mind-boggling. So there's all these stories about how, oh, they had like... So this is one guy with like 200 Spanish conquistadors or so. And he destroyed the literal largest empire on the planet in like two years. We're talking the actual largest empire on the entire surface of the planet. We're talking an absolutely massive, well-organized, agricultural, you know, military sophisticated society. He completely dismantled, stole all of their gold, and then went back to Spain and lived like a king, basically, within two years. So there's, and the thing is that Cortes was not, was was more sophisticated than the Aztec, but not as sophisticated as people think he is. Like, yeah, he had some steel weaponry, which was a big bonus. He had some gunpowder, which was a big bonus. But to the most part, what people don't understand about the story is also that he mostly won because there was already a lot of uh, like um, anger towards the king. So he was able to convince many native native tribes to join him in his fight against the king in the capital. So he had, and so and basically there's a way of conce- conceptualizing this as the idea is that he was a very marginally more intelligent or had marginally more access to more sophisticated diplomatic strategies than the Aztecs were used to seeing. You know, he... Whether or not this is true, you know, it's, it's a just so story. It's a just so story that had marginally better weaponry, marginally better tactics, and marginally better diplomat- diplomatic ability. And with that alone, he was able to dismantle the, the largest empire on the planet within two years. That's, for, as far as I see, a lower limit of what an AGI should be able to do. I say anything a human can do is the lower limit of what an AGI should be able to do, but just by definition. So, you know, so if we had an AGI that's, that's not, you know, 50% smart or 20% smarter than a human, but a hundred times smarter. I would expect it to be a hundred times more convincing, a hundred times more charismatic, a hundred times better at building better weaponry, a hundred times better at making money, a hundred times better at, at breaking the stock market and extracting profit, a hundred times better at politics. There is just, there's a failure mode in this idea of like trying to figure out how the AI would do X, but that's kind of a fundamental mistake. It's just like, we don't know what the intelligence system will do the same way we don't know how AlphaGo is going to play its next move. I don't know what move AlphaGo is going to play next, because if I did, I would already be as smart as AlphaGo, because I could just play how I think AlphaGo would play. So, But even so, I don't know how AlphaGo will play. I can predict that I think AlphaGo is going to win, just because I know that AlphaGo is a very powerful very strong player and very intelligent. So even so, I don't know how it's going to win. I predict it will win. And the same applies to these, to these age, strong AGI systems. I don't know how they're going to win, but I predict that they will win. So Connor, how do we know uh, when would this moment arrive? And how do we know it's not arrived already, that it's beyond our control? Honestly, we don't. I, it might have already happened. I, it's... There, there's very there's there's a lot of different ways of conceptualizing and, and like operationalizing this concept at the point of no return. It's like have what is the point of no return? Is it the moment when this first technology is first created? Is it the moment when no one can intervene? Is it the moment where we could intervene, but the people who could will not do so because of like economic incentives or whatever? It's a very hard question. And the answer is just we will not know until it's too late, obviously. And there is meaningful attempts at projection of like AI capacities, depending on certain models. For example, as I said, the Open Philanthropy Report is my personal favorite. I think that's a very good one. Um, They suggest like a 50% median chance of this kind of technology existing, I think around between like 2050 and 2070. I personally predict between 2030 and 2040. But so it's worth mentioning here that a lot of people say like, oh, actually AI researchers think this is far out. But if you actually survey AI researchers, the difference between the ones who think it's coming soon and the ones who think it's coming later is hilariously usually just a difference of like 20 years. 
there was like no one that I would consider a reasonable like voice in this in this field who does not think that this is going to come within like a century at most, maybe two. And I think two centuries is very pessimistic. It just would not make sense to me that it would take that long. So this is coming. It might already be here. Like, I think there is a good possibility that, for example, GPT-3 is way more intelligent than we think we it, it is, but we just don't know how to like interrogate it. We don't know how to judge its intelligence because it's so different from us. It's like, you know, I, I feel like a lot of people who like say, oh, GPT-3 isn't smart are kind of like trying to measure a fish by its ability to climb. Like, you know, if you, if you define intelligence as the ability to climb trees, then fish are really stupid. But I don't think that's a useful thing. Because again, I define intelligence as the ability to win. In water, you know, the ability to swim is really useful. So the fish is winning. So I would consider the fish to be winning in that situation. And GPT-3 was trained to predict text. I say GPT-3 is winning when it comes to predicting text. So it's, that, that, that's where these definitions become very hard and not super productive, in my opinion, to like get into like, you know, waste a lot of time discussing about it. We, we, we should focus on the ability. The important thing is the ability to win, the ability to have power, to do uh, power over human relevant things. There's a really funny quip I saw from, I think, Gwern uh, recently, where he basically said, um, he basically said, um, people keep saying, oh, the alignment problem is important. You know, it's like worrying about overpopulation on Mars, but they can't even align their ant level AIs right now, which is true. <laughs> like everyone keeps complaining about, oh, BERT is racist, GPT-3 is racist and whatever. We can't even align these systems. <laughs> and we predict that we can align superhuman systems. Makes no sense to me. Right. The simplest, uh, I mean, the simplest solution, which uh, I'm sure you have a very good argument why it won't work is you'd believe we can always switch it off the AI if it gets out of hand. Why can't we pull the plug? Uh, so yeah, uh, tell us why, why can't we pull the plug if AI becomes really dangerous? I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a very common thing uh, that people think. And unfortunately, I think it's not a very, it's a bit silly. Um, so this relies on something that's kind of called instrumental convergence. So let, let me explain instrumental convergence with a simple example. Say you have a robot and the robot's job is to get you coffee. It, it doesn't care about anything in the world other than getting you coffee. So um, the robot runs into the kitchen, you know, and, you know, rolls over your cat. And, you know, and then there's, the, then there's the, your baby right in front of it. It's just heading to the baby, just, you know, trample the baby because it doesn't care about it. The baby's in the way of the coffee. Who cares about the baby, right? So you rush over to hit the stop button. What happens? The robot will stop you. It'll grab your hand and put you away. Why? Because it reasons, well, if you turn me off then I can't get you coffee, so I must protect myself. I must defend my off button from you turning me off because otherwise I can't get you coffee. So this is obviously a bit of a silly example, but it makes sense. If we have a sufficiently intelligent system that has a goal and that goal requires it to be alive, it will resist attempts to being shut off because that's just part of its goal. We don't have to give it a sense of, you know, wanting to live or of consciousness or pain or any of that. It doesn't need any of that. All those things, humans have those things in order to, you know, stop us from, you know, getting ourselves killed in natural environments. The robot doesn't need that. Just by having a goal where it's useful to be alive, and that's most goals, that will already make it resist being shut off. And you might say, okay, what if we, you know, re rewire it and it wants to be, or allows itself to be shut off, blah, blah, blah. All those things are useful research um, directions, but I'll just, like, as far as I'm aware, we have not yet actually found a mathematical formalism of this that works in all scenarios. Like, there's some that works in some scenarios, like, what if you just reward the robot for, for if, you, if you shut it off, the same if you give it coffee. What happens, the robot immediately shuts itself off because that's much easier than getting you coffee. So it just immediately commits suicide. So that's also not what we want. So yeah. this, this argument of shutting it off sounds uh, abstract again, but I think we have a real example in the sense of Bitcoin, uh, where if you today ask, uh, no government in the world can shut it off. Uh, in that, that sense, well. yeah. really in, even without any, uh, Without, without any sort of sophistication, even through economic incentives, a super intelligence can, uh, in some sense, uh, get immune to getting shut off, no matter how we want to shut it off. Yeah, yeah. A friend of mine had said that similarly, is that 
if you you can't shut down Google even if you wanted to because so many people have an economic incentive to keep Google going that they will fight you they will send lawyers they will you know they will sue you they will stop you they will try to stop you from shutting down Google and AIs are going to be extremely economically lucrative they will produce insane amounts of money so of course there's going to be corporations and lawyers and you know people behind these things trying to protect them. And even if it doesn't at first, an AI can always convince or just pay people to do that. If you have a very powerful AI system that can make money, it can just pay its own lawyers. <laughs> um, and so, Connor, since a lot of research, AI research is happening in companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, uh, what's your view on how seriously do they take the question of AI safety? Is enough being... Uh, if enough are enough safeguards being put on, are they interested in this problem at all, or is it a very academic thing? I think they are doing an absolutely terrible job. I am really unhappy with how most AI labs in industry address alignment. Uh, I understand why. I don't think these are bad people. I want to make this very, very clear. I don't think these are like evil scheming people. Like, ha ha ha, we're going to make evil AI. No, I don't think that is the whole truth. I think these are very intelligent, well-meaning people that have just been exposed to strange arguments or not exposed to good arguments about why there, why certain things might be a problem. And also, very unfortunately, there is this, you know, there's the saying, never, never rely on a man to understand something when his salary depends on not understanding it. Google has an incentive to downplay the risk of AI, obviously. Like you can see that with, you know, the with recent dramas I will not get into but people that know know what I'm talking about. It's corporations are pro to AGI optimizing for profit. If they see a way to build a AI, which has you know, a 50% chance of blowing up the world, but a 50% chance of making tons of money, I wouldn't rely on them to make the right choice. I'm not saying they couldn't, it's possible. There are good people in these organizations that I do trust and I think do mean well, but there's the dual problem of wrong incentives, like that's one of the reasons I left not just at industry, but I also left academia. So I'm not an academic, actually. I dropped out of, of college because I think academia is also corrupt and has the wrong, not evil. Not, I'm not it's very clear. It's not that they're evil. It's just a broken system. It's just the incentives are wrong to work on the big problems that actually need solving, even if you don't make money off of it. Because like whoever solves AI alignment is not going to be rich from it. I mean, he's going to be rich because the AI will create heaven on earth and, you know, give everyone lots of money probably. But they themselves, you know, aren't going to, you know, create a startup and make lots of money off of it. Like that's not what you do if you want to make money. If you want to make money, don't work on AI alignment. At least currently. That might change in the future. It might be in the future that AI alignment becomes like a very profitable thing to work on. I have very complex beliefs about that. It's, it's a long story. But... Yeah, there's also a cultural historical kind of problem is that, um, I mean, as cynical as it sounds, science advances one funeral at a time, is that in many ways, these like alignment type arguments came out of very untypical corners. They weren't, you know, they didn't come top down from like, you know, well-respected Harvard academics. They came from like, weirdos on the internet. And it definitely still has a very strong, like, um, smell of weirdos on the internet, which I think is a really bad metric, first of all, because there's are really smart weirdos on the internet. But if you're a professor and you, or you are, you know, you're an assistant professor, you want to get tenure, you want to, you know, raise up in the ranks of your institutional system, you have to do things that are popular. It's all about social games. It's all about, you know, impressing your dean. It's all about, you know, impressing the people above you. It's all about playing the game. It's all about being conservative. You can't come in and then say things are not that are like they're like low status, and you know only only weirdos on the internet believe that stuff. It's getting better, so there's been you know some really um, like as I said, like Bostrom and especially Stuart Russell has kind of like been trying to like champion this to make it a more um, mainstream focused thing, which I think is good. I'm not actually sure if it's good or not. Like this might be a little bit of a silly of a strange argument, but I don't know if. You know, getting more people involved is the number one thing we need to be focusing on because, like, this is very hard technical problems. Um, and there's always the problem that if a, something becomes too popular, it always becomes politicized. 
And that's a big threat, unfortunately, is that like, for example, climate change. Is that climate change is fundamentally a technological scientific problem. You know, they're, they're, it was scientists who discovered a scientific fact and wanted to tell people about the scientific fact and what scientific things we can do about it. But unfortunately, it became extremely politicized. A better example even might be genetically modified crops. So I live in Germany, and here genetically engineered crops are actually illegal. They actually, they, the greens in Germany are very powerful. The, there's a very powerful green lobby in Germany, and they have successfully shut down all GMO crops and also successfully shut down nuclear energy. Two things I personally think the evidence points towards both of these things being very good things for the environment. And the reasoning was not based on scientific evidence. The reasoning was based on politicized tribal you know, beliefs or like purity and natural bias and whatever. I want to make clear again, I do not think these people are evil. I do not think the, you know, the Green Party in Germany and what they did with nuclear power and GMOs was an evil scheming cabal trying to harm people or the environment. But the effects are the same, is that if you politicize an issue instead of letting the evidence speak for itself, there are chances are very high that you will harm the cause more than you will help. Right. In that sense, I mean, uh, corporations and economies, sort of they are uh, non-human agencies, which is, is continuing to push AI further and further. In that sense, it's some, sometimes I just feel maybe it's already there. The cat is out of the bag because the systems are unstoppable. Even if superhuman AI is not there, the vectors that will make it possible are just already very evident. Um, and, and in that case, uh, say government's role becomes even more important. Um, I'm not sure uh, because I'm not uh, from this field, but I'd love to hear more about you, whether you feel government should be regulating, uh, should be interfering, or should it be more offhands? And if it should be regulating, is it doing enough? So, um... There are a lot of people that believe that exactly what you just say, that you know, government involvement in policy of AI is extremely important. I know people from these fields, I respect people from this field, but I think they're absolutely wrong. I think they are catastrophically, categorically wrong. And not because it couldn't work, but just because I don't see the evidence that it will work. So uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a good essay by Elias Yudkowsky, which basically says the following. Imagine someone, so he, he talked to a friend, I think I, I might be, misremember, but this is basically how the story goes. The story is, he talks to a friend of his, and his friend of his says, you know, to solve AI, we have to use democracy. You know, we have to make a democratized process to, you know, collect the human values and, you know, make AI safe. And then Elias says, why should we use democracy? And then his friend's like, what? That makes any sense. So he explains like this. Imagine I told you, we should use the, let the Coca-Cola Corporation do AGI. We should let, we should use, let the Coca-Cola Corporation take over AI research completely and regulate it. Well, your first question would be, why would we use the Coca-Cola Corporation? Have they done well in the past? Is there any evidence that they are good at this kind of task? Do they have spe specific capabilities that will allow them to handle this task efficiently? And we should ask the same thing about government. We have to look back into the history and say, has government in the past performed well on these kinds of tasks? Is this a, a problem that we expect the systems of government to perform well on? And there are some people that might say yes. There's some people that might say no, but we have to try, which I think is a fair argument. But as far as I'm concerned, I think government has extremely failed us when it comes to technology. I think government is way too slow. It is very corrupt. It has been captured by special interest groups to a large degree. And it has done a very, very, very poor job of regulating technology in a way that both promotes the positives of technology while curbing the negatives. And to be clear, I want to get into clear, I don't think this is... I mean, some politicians are evil, but I don't think most of them are evil. I think most of them are just products of the system. They're just, they're not, they're incentivized to act in certain ways that might not be in mind. And there's a second problem, which the second problem is, assuming you elected me dictator of the world and I can pass any law I want, I would have no idea what law to pass. I have no freaking clue what to do to to make this better because as far as i'm as i can see this this is a technical problem there is a social aspect to it every every technical problem has a social aspect to it of course you know there has to be funding there has to be support there has to be you know to, to a large degree of population acceptance i'm not dismissing these factors but this uh, seems like an unusually technical problem to me like let's be honest 
to solve climate change, you just need cheap solar cells. The moment yeah. solar is cheaper than fossil, the problem is solved. You don't need political support. Sure, political support would be great, but how well did government do on, on you know, climate change over the last decades? Not particularly great. And I think AGI is a much harder problem than climate change. I think climate change is actually basically solved because right now solar is falling in cost below fossil fuels. And then I think the problem is solved. There you go. Climate change is no more. It's going to take a while. But I don't see, but that, that was what was needed to happen. And I think AGI has a similar trajectory. If we just develop the technical tools to create aligned AGI, everyone's going to use them. If I just told Google, hey, here's how you can build an aligned AI, they'll be like, cool, thanks. We're going to make a ton of money off of this. And I'll be like, yeah, cool, make money off of it. Good luck. Because if they're making money off of aligned AI, great. We all benefit from that. There's nothing, I don't, like, if I could just give every government, every corporation the tools to build aligned AI, I would just do that. Uh, it's fine. That the problem would be solved. Say in the worst case, we are not able to come up with a good solution for alignment. Uh, I think then the argument is, why don't we just shut off all the research that's happening and prevent uh, any, any further progress in AI? Has that argument also been discussed and addressed? Yes, that is an argument that does raise its head ever so and so often. Um, I don't think it makes sense for multiple reasons, but the main one is just that will not work. Like it's just, that is just ridiculous. I, I, I cannot imagine any possible world in which you could regulate access to like computers and like, you know, heart and like stuff to such a degree that not only will no research happen within your country, but also in all other countries. This is also a military and just economic advantage. Even if somehow we got like, you know, one country to agree to stop AI research, all the, all the AI research is going to move to China or something, you know, where it's still allowed. And they're going to be incentivized to do that because if there's one country that has AI and the other doesn't, which one's going to win economically and militarily? And it's also, there's also another argument here, which is less polarizing. It's just people are suffering. Like the world isn't great. People are in pain. People are sick. People are hungry and AI law, it shows us a possibility to solve these unbelievable, terrible injustices. And in many ways, it is a moral obligation, I think, for us to solve them. If we have a tool to solve world hunger, I think we have a moral obligation to attempt to use that tool. Of course, you know, it's a, it's a risk benefit calculus. It's, it's never black and white. Okay. I've been saving uh, my favorite question until the end and I uh, would love for you to sketch out maybe a few solutions uh, that are discussed for aligning AI with human values. All right. So to be clear, I don't think we have any uh, any proposal currently that I think has like more than a 30% chance of working. That's way better than it was like three years ago. Back then we had like nothing, but like all, all solutions I'm going to check, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sketch here. I have, have all like less than 30% chance of okay. working in my opinion. So, um, I'm just gonna like quickly run over a few of them. If people are interested in the in, in the detail, it's a, unfortunately very technical and it's like not really much mainstream accessible stuff, but you're interested in technical resources, I can provide those. So um, one of the quote unquote oldest or like uh, is what's called iterated distillation and amplification. Uh, this is a large class of proposals, not like one exact proposal with like a lot of proposals. It's basically the idea that um, you give a human an AI that's like dumber than them so they can supervise it. And then, so they can like make sure this AI is good. And then you make that AI bigger and you use that bigger AI to train a smart, a, a, again, a like slightly small, slightly bigger AI and, and to make it good. And then you blow up that AI and use it to train a little bit smarter AI. And you can't do it over and over and over again. And you hope because you have like this like hierarchy of like, you know, a human at the top who supervises one AI, who supervises another AI, who supervises another AI, who supervises another AI, that this could lead to alignment. It's a very simplified version of this approach. It's like way more complicated than that. But yeah, that's like an old one. This is like, um, it's one of Paul Cristiano. He's at OpenAI nowadays. He's one of his approaches. He's had like many, he's, he's like one of the geniuses of the field. He's had a lot of really, really good ideas. Um, I personally don't think this will work for multiple reasons. Um, I'm just gonna like skip over it. I just I just like the idea that, you know, the human supervising AI will result in a good AI. I think that just fundamentally doesn't work. Um, there's been some other ideas, like a, a kind of a variant of this is alignment via debate. 
So it's the idea that you have two AIs and or like two copies of the same AI and they debate with each other about what you're supposed to do. So one of them is the quote unquote good AI, which is trying to help you. And the other AI is trying to find holes in the other one's argument. And so the hope is, is that if these AIs are equally intelligent, if there's a flaw in the first argument, the other one will find it and point it out to the human, the human can dismiss it. There's a lot of reasons why this might or might not work. I'm, I'm sure you can see some of the problems that would pop up with a proposal like this, but I think it's very interesting. And um, maybe, you know, depending on how things work, I don't know, I think it's interesting and I'm happy that people are researching it. Um, another one is inverse reinforcement learning. So this is kind of like related to what um, Sue Russell does at Berkeley. And it's the idea that you, it's kind of like reinforcement learning where you have like a reward trying to maximize, except that the robot doesn't actually know what its reward is, but it has to learn it. So you have, it says, that, okay, the idea is you have a human and the human has a reward function, but you don't know what it is. So you have to find out what it is. So the idea is that in this like formalism, if the robot is unsure, instead of just doing something stupid, it would ask a human and say, is this good or is this good? I think this is a pointing to a very good approach. I think the exact formalism currently being used has some weaknesses, but that's just because it's early research. Like I, I have quite a lot of confidence in the people working on this. I think they're very smart. And I think there's a good chance that they will produce really, and they've already produced some very interesting results. So this is another one I find, um, I find, find promising. Um, so yeah, like there's also a few like stranger ones that we don't know much about because they're kind of secretive. So like the, the like the one I'm, ta I'm thinking about is called uh, is from Miri, uh, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, which is probably the oldest like um, organization in this field. And since 2018, they have actually decided to not publish their research anymore. Uh, it's complicated why, but basically they kind of have this like belief that a lot of research should be secret because it's dangerous. Uh, it, it's a complicated philosophical argument. You should read their essays on it. They write very, very long, very good essays. So we don't exactly know what they're working on. Um, they recently released an update that their latest research didn't work out. It's just what they were trying to do didn't seem to work. Um, they have very different approaches because they approach these things from an extremely mathematical perspective. So they want to like, develop universal ideas of intelligence. They want to you know, find a in Newton's laws of intelligence. And then, because they say, we are so confused about what intelligence even means, about what alignment even means. We should first sit down and try to define what is intelligence, what is alignment, and then try to, you know, find a solution to it, kind of. But yeah, I, I can't say much about what right. they're currently working on, also because I don't understand a lot of what they're working on. Um, the last, uh, I think, major approach, like there, there is a lot of like other like, uh, early results or like research agendas of like individual scientists. Like a lot of alignment research is like the individual product of individuals. You know, I, I, you know, I could shout out like, you know, Stuart Armstrong's value loading proposals, uh, Vanessa Kosoy's learning uh, based approach to RL, which I'm a big fan of, but I'm too stupid to understand. Um, those are all interesting. Um, so like one of the things that I've currently been looking into and that I hope to do research on in, in the near term future is kind of this pro a concept that uh, John Wentworth has called alignment by default, which is a little bit, which is an interesting idea. I give it a less than like 20% chance of working, but I currently see it as the best one for me to work on directly. Well, actually I work on two different things, but like, let me explain this one first. So the idea is that if you have a predictive model of the universe that is sufficiently strong, that's like really good at predicting things, you know, it understands how the world works, it should naturally figure out what human values are because those are just a part of its environment. And if you can then find quote unquote, where in its model those things are, it just point to that and say, here, do that thing, that actually might be enough. There's, there's, there's some mathematical reasoning or like, like there's, some, there's some more reasoning about why this might or might not work. It seems maybe a bit silly, but I think this could really work. So the idea is that instead of trying to write down what human values are, which seems to probably be very, very hard or impossible, it's the idea that if you just have a smart enough system, it will figure it out by its own. You just then have to find out how to tell it to do that and not other things. How hard it is to do that is currently very unclear. It, and it depends on like 
properties of the universe that we just don't know. Like the example he gives is that if you have a, uh, you know, a object recognition um, neural network, it will naturally figure out what trees are. Even if you never showed a label of a tree, it will naturally start to understand this concept of branches and trees and leaves, even if you never tell it about it, because those are natural abstractions of the universe. And so the one of the questions is, are human values a natural abstraction of the universe or not? Is it something an AI will just naturally pick up on or not? Very unclear at this point, but that's like one of the things I've been working on. I've also been interested in like these more super abstract theories of like, okay, can we define intelligence? Can we define suffering? Can we define values in like a mathematical sense somehow? But that's more something I do in my spare time. It's, I think these methods can work. I think these like really high level methods can work, but they might just take too long. It, AI is coming so soon. It might take us too long to figure this out. And we might have to just try our best to create, like, it's like here's the best case scenario. Best case scenario where everything goes, this is for me, this is the dream scenario. I hope this is how things work. In the best possible world, what happens is, is we build AIs and we figure out that they, and we figure out that we can align them pretty good. Not perfectly, but like pretty good. You know, we find like they have like an embedding for human values and we can like optimize for that pretty well. And then we use these to build a more aligned AI. And that more aligned AI now has a much better model of human values, optimizes for that, and then produces another one, which is an even better model of human values. And then eventually maybe some of them finds the ultimate, you know, more realist theory of what to do. I mean, if such a thing even exists, probably not, but you know, and then we kind of like, you know, you know, bootstrap ourselves up this alignment hierarchy. That would be, in my case, in my opinion, the best case scenario. I don't know if that's going to be true or not. That's going to depend on not just our work, but also on just some facts about the universe. How much of these natural abstractions exist? How hard are human values to encapsulate? We don't know. So many of these approaches uh, right now they are at a theoretical level, right? Where there is a lot of debate and discussion. Are there any AI systems that exist today where these theories can be applied and we can iterate and learn from it? For example, self-driving cars, where uh, the ethical dilemmas of what to do if uh, uh, someone comes in front of it, is is the community thinking about iteratively improving upon it or is it more on we need to get to a good enough solution at a theoretical level first and then we'll apply them? So I think we have to kind of like separate two problems here. We have on the one hand, this philosophical problem of what is good. And then we have the other problem is assuming we know what is good, how do we get our, our machine to do that? So I'm focusing more on the second problem. The first problem is an important problem and one I think about a lot, but it is a different type of problem. It, it, it needs a different type of you know, research, so to speak. Um, it's not that people in the field aren't aware of it or don't work on it. It's just, we should separate these two problems. And the second one is definitely the, the, the more, uh, technical problem in the, in the sense. So I personally think that depending on your different definition of an alignment, there is a lot of research that tries stuff like this. Um, the classic example is in, um, in language models, you know, how do we get our language models to not be terrible and racist or something? Like, I personally think the language models are probably not super dangerous. Like, even if they say something racist, you know, it's like stupid, but you know, probably not the end of the world. Um, I don't know, maybe it is, um, but it's a great test bed. So I, that's what I want, like, want to research, or what I'm, built, you know, currently in the process of researching, is using these language models as kind of like test beds for like trying to figure out: Do these embeddings of human values exist? Do they learn these? Can we extract them? What happens if we try to train on those? Like, if we, like, this is an experiment I'm currently running actually with some with some colleagues. We're trying to figure out, okay, is there a morality or like a normative axis inside of GPT models? Can we extract it? And if we then fine tune a GPT model with reinforcement learning on this like morality or normativity or whatever score, does it, what does it produce? Like, does it go crazy? Does it produce something actually very sensible? Um, the, it's a very much an early stage. Like the world al word alignment was barely used in the mainstream until like 2018. So it's like, it's like, this is a lot of it is still very much theoretical and what I would call deconfusion. It's like, kind of like figuring out what problem are we trying to solve even, but yeah, but like debate, um, 
has also had some work done on it that's like semi sort of experimental. Like they mostly experiment with humans. It's like the idea is like they, they have humans debate and they try to figure out are there ways we can get humans to debate so that the true one always wins. So um, yeah, uh, Beth Barnes, I think was her name and um, Paul Cristiano at OpenAI work on these kind of things. Um, uh, the stuff done at Berkeley, so with like inverse reinforcement learning is definitely technical. So they have, you know, they train actual neural network reinforcement learning agents using these techniques and then see how they act in like various toy scenarios. So there is some technical work for sure. It's not production ready. This is definitely research, but it is starting to become something that people can actually experiment with. Right. Yeah, I was just thinking, for example, self-driving cars are a reality now. And one approach to solve ethical dilemmas there is to just program it that uh, something like utilitarian or some other method, you cause the least amount of suffering. But the other one is something like inverse reinforcement learning, where the system could learn how a human could behave on good enough data points. And all you do is point to the system when it makes a mistake and say the human would have done the same. So that is what I was curious about is are these kinds of experiments happening or uh, I mean, I, I'm sure there are, but like, especially self-driving cars is more of a PR problem than a technical problem. The problem of whether to do X or Y in a situation is a purely a PR problem for the company. It's, there's not an objectively, I mean, depending on your morality. And it's like, they've done experiments on this where they like give people different scenarios and people pick, oh, I would do A or B and people don't agree. And they're never going to agree. You're always going to find someone who says whatever you did is literally Hitler, you know, and you're terrible. So this is far more of a PR problem than an alignment problem. The problem isn't that our machine isn't doing what we tell it to do in this case. It's more that we're not sure what to tell it to do that will make people happy or that people will find acceptable. So like self-driving cars, at some point, of course, alignment will become a problem when they become arbitrary intelligent. But like uh, self-driving cars aren't trying to be AGI. Now, it doesn't mean they couldn't be, become AGI one day, but they're not trying to. While stuff like language model with GPT-3 is trying to be an AGI. It's like, it, it, its goals are much more broad. It's, and we say through reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is trying to train agents to achieve goals. Yeah. Which is it, you know, far more AGI. It just indicates how difficult this problem for the AGI is going to be, because if we can't agree on how self-driving cars should behave, how would we agree upon how should AGI would absolutely should, should behave? Yeah, that's, I mean, as I said, that's that's like a separate problem. Like, I think we have to first figure out how to make these things not literally destroy the universe. And then we can like, <laughs> squ- you know, uh, you know, then we can like quibble about whether or not we use deontological utilitarian theories or whatever. Like, I feel like there's a, again, it's philosophy and a deadline. It's like the deadline's important. Yeah. And I mean, I have my own philosophical theories that I think are true, of course, you know, and the other ones that I think are very stupid, like as everyone does. Okay. I have my own sense of morality, but um, I'm hopeful that, I mean, the end of the day, like one of my favorite, one of my favorite uh, studies is it shows that a moral philosophy professors are, do not act any more moral than normal persons, which is really funny if you think about it. Is like I, a huge amount of human morality is just hiding human biases. It's just, you know, it's just status regulation and tribalism and stuff, but like couched in like pretty sounding words to make it sound moral. But the actual reason is just, I'm greedy, give me resources. And I mean, with, with self-driving cars, that's going to happen. People are going to sue self-driving car companies, not because they did anything unethical, but because saying it was unethical is going to get them more money at court. But that's just a thing that's going to happen. I understand why it's going to happen. I'm not judging these people. I'm just saying that's that's a thing that's going to happen. And of course, people will have an incentive to disagree with whatever compromise we come up with at AGI because disagreeing will give them potentially a better bargaining position to bargain more resources out of whatever thing we might come up with, probably. Or maybe the AGI will just be so convincing that it convinces everyone that it's right all the time. Who knows? <laughs> Great, Connor. So let me just end with this uh, last uh, question about Elitior AI. Uh, what it is, what are you doing there? And also, since you're not from academia and industry, how do you fund the effort? Uh, yeah. 
So yeah, Luther AI is kind of a, a hobby project turned big project that I, start, that I started with two other people, um, Sid Black and Leo Gao, um, back in July, I think it was. It started kind of just as a tongue-in-cheek kind of thing, like, hey guys, you know, GPT is pretty, pretty cool. Let's try to let's try to replicate it. Let's see if we can, how far we can get. And it kind of spiraled from there. We got lots of really, really cool people involved, trying to work on really cool projects. So we had a lot of re, uh, hardware from Google. It turned out to not be enough for GPT-3. Um, but recently, uh, uh, like a like a crypto miner slash cloud company called CoreWeave has approached us and they said, hey guys, we love what you're doing. We're gonna give you access to a, you know, a lot of GPUs to train this. And that's kind of what we're working on right now. So, I mean, so our, our, since we are just a glorified Discord server, basically, um, we have very little expenses, so we don't pay anyone. It's all volunteer work. Uh, we have some small uh, like cloud bills to pay. So, you know, we, we host like some servers and stuff. Those are currently fully covered by donations from generous individuals around from the community. It's not much money, but it's, I mean, it's not small amounts of money. So like if our donors listen to this, thank you very much for your support. We really appreciate it. But yeah, our, our very much our goal is currently, we've actually like um, did we've not, not taken money in the past. Or like said, tell to people like, like we don't take investment. We're not a commercial entity. We're not, uh, looking for that kind of money. We don't even know what we would do if we had a lot of money because we don't really have managers. We're all just, you know, we're all just volunteers in our free time, having a lot of fun, making really, doing really cool projects. And we kind of want to keep it that way, at least for the moment. This might change in the future. Maybe in the future, we're going to, you know, make it a nonprofit and accept like, larger donations and try to like give out funds or like hire people, maybe. Currently unclear. But at the moment, um, yeah, we're basically a Discord uh, community of, in my totally unbiased opinion, really, really great people, really smart people, and working really cool, cool projects together, uh, and get some of the best ML discussions you'll find anywhere, in my opinion. I think you, you can just drop in and get really high quality discussions about, about any technical topics. That's been a, 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 a real blessing. It's been, it's been really, really great. Um, yeah. Um, what else is there to say? Then you know, check us out at luther.ai. Um, I hope the spelling is in is in the title or the description because it's a weird spelling. <laughs> <laughs> I will put that in description. And, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So we're all, we're always looking for people to join. Um, like, if you're also interested in like, the alignment stuff I've been talking about, like these like alignment by default proposals, that's something I'm currently trying to get get going. So if you're interested in working on that. We need uh, both, I mean, most of all, we need ML devs to work on our various ML projects, but we can also use some web developers. So if you're like a, I don't know, if you're like web developer, get in contact with me. Um, yeah, what else is there to say? It's a, it's a cool project. Um, we hope we're gonna take it really far. We hope to get our, our GPT-3 um, system or GPT-NEO done this year and release it open source. We've already published a paper and we hope to publish many more. Thanks, Connor. This has been, uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and hopefully uh, a lot of people will discover Eleuther AI and uh, join you in your efforts and hopefully you and your fellow researchers in AI safety will prevent us from getting extinct and we have all the AI utopia everyone has been promising. Well, thank you so much for having me. All I can say is I don't know how to save the world, but damn it, we're going to try. <laughs> all the best and bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Take care.